announcement about some stage with us for the applause of wisdom for two more minutes, for a few more minutes, as we welcome to the stage uh, Minister Kazuhide Ishikawa, who will uh, have a seat right here, and uh, also Dr. Carol Bean. Okay. And we will the last panel for the day, and this is an extremely important panel because it deals with natural catastrophes, and the world has had its share of natural catastrophes recently in Haiti, in Chile, in Japan. So it is very important for us to uh, uh, listen uh, from, uh, in back from uh, Minister uh, Kazuhide Ishikawa. Uh, Minister Kazuhide Ishikawa graduated in 1980 from the University of Tokyo in the uh, Faculty of Arts and Science. ...to ensure those measures to, to be taken in an appropriate manner. And food safety is very important, of course and some vegetables and dairy products distribution in, in specific areas has been restricted to ensure safety. Now, uh, I would uh, like to touch upon the assistance from all over the world. We are very, very grateful that more than 130 countries and uh, 39 international organizations has, have expressed intentions to extend help and assistance to us. Uh, rescue teams from 22 countries and regions, medical team from Israel, donations from 38 countries, relief groups from 30 countries and regions and international organizations. But among them, the U.S. provide the greatest assistance. Uh, your rescue team um, sent by the USAID. Well, you must be proud of that. One of the two teams, uh, of two, two rescue teams, is from Fairfax County and Washington, Greater area. <laughs> Another one is from Los Angeles area, and they work day and night in the dark and the cold, without electricity, without gas, without anything. And also the U.S. military in, in Japan. Uh, they call it Operation Tomodachi. Tomodachi means uh, friends in Japanese. Under this uh, Operation Tomodachi, more than 20,000 personnel, 20 ships, and 160 aircrafts are engaged in the operation for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And your government officials and nuclear experts have been sent to Japan, and we are closely discussing these reactor issues every day with their uh, Japanese uh, counterparts. We have received a lot of goodwill messages, solidarity statements, contributions from all over the United States of America. The American Red Cross has collected more than 120 million dollars, and various NGOs are working tirelessly as well. And last but not least, individual Americans. Let me tell you one of my personal, personal experience. A couple of weeks ago, I saw a young mother with a small girl uh, sitting on the picnic table on the street in Washington downtown. They were selling homemade cookies to collect money to donate them to Japan. This is all a movie. So, um, <coughs> there is a tremendous risk to be a test for Japan, uh, but uh, disasters and uh, accidents could happen anywhere in the world. So that is uh, exactly what uh, our, our international community is working on now. One, learning from our experience, second, share information, and three, mutual cooperation. So one day we will pick up as uh, President for President Obama uh, 
Hindry came to the Embassy of Japan to sign the Book of Condolences, as well as uh, Secretary Clinton and many, many, oh, Vice President Biden too, many, many ministers and uh, secretaries uh, warmly came to sign the book. Uh, so, as uh, President Obama warmly stated, Japan will be stronger. And let me conclude by saying that thank you for standing with us in such a difficult time. Thank you. And what the government uh, tried to do is that uh, disseminate information as much as possible, as quickly as possible, what's going on and what the damage is, uh, uh, the level of damage is. And uh, uh, for the, um, right after the uh, tsunami and earthquakes, uh, uh, what was uh, most urgent was that uh, were there any after 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 shocks, <laughs> after shocks, <so. laughs> and other uh, other following tsunamis coming. Uh, those are the kind of moment we are so sensitive about. Uh, so we uh, do, did our best to try to disseminate information as much as possible, that one. Then, um, try to ide identify the, the uh, level of damages, uh, air level damages, what kind of uh, uh, necessities uh, uh, are required. Food, water, or blankets, gasoline, those kind of damage. And in order for us to provide those uh, necessities, are their delivery systems okay, like uh, highway system is all right, or, or railway is all right, those kind of things. The uh, entire government tried to check all the, those kind of uh, choking points for the uh, 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 transformation of labels, those kind of things. And then comes the uh, reactor issues. Um, you may have seen that uh, the first thing, as I said, first thing uh, which was quite urgent was to cool down the reactors. Uh, First, we, we pump the water from the helicopters, and then from the ground. And then we first use the seawater, uh, because of the shortage of the water. Then uh, we, uh, we switched from seawater to natural, normal water. And then try to turn on the lights, which is very, very important. It's not destroyed it. So we try to recover it. Uh, then one by one, um, while we try to bring it under control, but every day new challenges, new problems uh, came to us. Uh, like the one, the contaminated water uh, leaking into the sea water, those kind of things. Um, since this is a kind of crisis management, uh, so uh, while we are doing this crisis management, for things to, to cool down the reactors, um, then while doing that, we must think about the future strategies, what the next step, what the, what the lesson, what, what the, uh, uh, lessons we learn from this. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in these operations, I must say that uh, the United States government is most helpful to us. Thank you so much. And there's one more question I would like to ask um, for the whole panel. But the Japanese people have been a model as well as for how our population should unite in times of crisis. What difference exists between Japan and natural disasters in the U.S., which usually result in looting and chaos, as an example, Hurricane Katrina? Since I'm a diplomat, I'm not in a position to make any comments about what the U.S. government is doing. <laughs> uh, perhaps, uh, uh, to, to, to put it in a general way, perhaps any government, if faced with this kind of uh, disasters, uh, perhaps without some confusions or problems, perhaps we cannot do without those kind of confusions at first. Um, but what is important is that, well, we learn a lesson from every tragedy all over the world, that's what I said. And uh, uh, the, we learn a lesson from what you did in, in case of Katrina or every earthquakes. 
um, you are learning from our experience in our country. Have, uh, we have learned a lot from the uh, tsunamis in uh, Southeast Asia uh, almost 10 years ago. So it's a kind of accumulation of knowledge and share information of the lessons is uh, something that, that is quite important. So in that sense, I, I, I stress the importance of uh, international cooperation uh, to, to deal with these uh, kind of natural disasters. Thank you. I was uh, in uh, Haiti uh, a few times after uh, the, uh, the earthquake and uh, I can assure you that uh, in many countries there is a sort of resilience okay? and Haiti is a perfect example of resilience after a major catastrophe. Uh, when people talk about looting, I don't like to talk about that too much because people who are in desperate situations, sometimes they uh, respond in a very desperate way, particularly in a country where uh, there is poverty. And uh, one thing that is uh, extraordinary in uh, Haiti is that there was a lot of resilience. Okay? Sometimes the media likes to focus on certain aspects. Uh, if there is one little pocket where people loot, whether it's Katrina, whether it's uh, uh, Haiti, the uh, cameras like to zero in on that, uh, totally forgetting that very large, uh, the larger percentage of the population is extremely resilient, extremely organized. In Haiti, there is what they call a combit, and the combit is a, a form of uh, a solidarity among poor people. And this has worked extremely well in Haiti, I must say. And uh, uh, in, uh, in Louisiana as well, people helped each other a great deal in Louisiana during uh, and after the catastrophe. So I would not uh, focus on that aspect because it's a little bit like blaming the victim. If I could say something, uh regarding the situation, all of these natural catastrophes that we face. We've had a lot of talk about language and how the social media, the social networking has contributed to um, arrival of materials, to dissemination of information. One of the things that I'm always struck by is the unity that occurs among people in times of disasters. Uh, you can take a blackout anywhere in the world and, and neighbors who didn't know each other, didn't used to speak to each other, uh, they come together at least for the moment of the crisis. Sometimes when we're dealing with, we as North Americans or wherever we happen to be from, in assisting people, uh, whether it be Japan or Haiti or Chile, it's a matter of language takes on a different meaning. Uh, in Haiti, we have a situation where there was a, a need for people going down to join the humanitarian efforts to acquire some knowledge of Creole, because it is not an English-speaking country, obviously, and it is not a French-speaking country. Japan and Chile both have the advantages of having a common language to uh, facilitate, but not the Creole-speaking population in the United States uh, is fairly limited. One of the things that happened at Howard is that the, uh, with Dr. Sophocle and myself and the students in the simultaneous interpretation program that we have here, offered, opened that up to train uh, students, uh, Haitian Americans, many of them, who have a working knowledge of Creole to help them develop their skills in interpretation and also to uh, well, opening it up to other people who wish to learn. Because being able to really fully assist to get the information, even to get all of the details of the stories that have, that have happened, that have happened in, in Japan, that have happened in Chile, that have happened in Haiti, certainly. You, you have a certain door of access to finding out about people's lives. We can see the waves, we can see the devastation of the hurricane. But when you're able actually to communicate with people after perhaps some of the trauma settles down, uh, if they feel like talking about it, and sometimes knowing that there is a venue that they can talk with people about what has happened to them that is so monumental in their own language is something that, that's very helpful. So this is another 
way in which we can think about language and the natural catastrophe and its impact on all of us. Because I think we're all moved as we hear these stories. Uh, we're moved by in hearing about incidents of the mother and daughter selling cookies, um, about Ms. Allen's friend who keeps them in contact, and uh, all of these are simply doors of communication that we have to that enable us to heal and to get better. Okay, I have a question. Given the economic inter interconnectivity of many nations and current economic crisis facing many countries, how do natural disasters affect the improvement of economic sustainability throughout the globe? affect the improvement of economic sustainability throughout the globe? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the examples I, I was reminded is that uh, there is a very small island of the Hokkaido, Hokkaido is the northern part of Japan, uh, which uh, a couple of years ago was hit by uh, heavy uh, earthquakes and tsunami. And uh, the uh, infrastructure of that small island was totally broken. A couple of years later, because of the uh, huge investment made to that small island, what current island look like is a kind of a gorgeous resort attracting so many tourists all over Japan. So that is a one, one kind of example that, uh, from, from disaster to kind of fortune. Of course, there are people that there is a tremendous loss. Um, another one is that, uh, um, perhaps not directly answering the questions, but uh, in today's case, uh, the internet was, um, was very, very helpful to help search and rescue missions. Uh, because the, all the uh, telegram systems were broken and uh, uh, wireless system was in, in some cases operating. So using your cell phones and uh, internet and others, you were able to locate your friends or family. So perhaps uh, uh, it is now uh, we must think about those kinds of uh, uh, current modern equipment to be utilized more in case of the uh, disasters. Okay. I want to ask this, open this up. Thank you so much. I want to open this up to the whole panel. Um, what are your thoughts on how climate change disproportionately impacts people of color and women. And I would like to start with Ambassador Barnes. Uh, this sounds like an exam <laughs> question. <laughs> I, um, the idea of, of, of climate change and how it affects women, the one thing about it is that I think there's so many women that are also poor. And uh, people who live in uh, situations of poverty or lower income, they don't think or worry or divine about natural disasters or climate change, etc. They live their lives day to day. And so when something uh, hits, like uh, climate change, and uh, a lot of people do not want to rain, for example, Katrina with climate change, or like some of the other things, uh, natural disasters with climate change. But I would go so far as to say I think there is some relativity. But I would say that most people, uh, and decidedly, a lot of women who are in a certain class economically, that is not 
of relevance to them as they lead their daily lives. I would like to say also that most people in general don't think about climate change and how it affects their lives. The one thing I do, I have really gained from the experience of what happened in Japan was to see how many people did have reinforced homes and built their homes to try and sustain certain, certain amount of uh, natural disaster. And uh, you see this in certain areas of California, although I don't know why anyone would build a house on an, a fault that's going to get an earthquake in X amount of years, and they build them anyway, because all it does is up all of our insurance policy premiums. Mm -hmm. But people build homes that, uh, in California that possibly be earthquake proof, although I have my questions about it. And there are those who build the houses that can withstand mudslides, etc. But um, as it affects women, as usual, they have to prepare and be prepared to do things like how do we how do I keep my baby diapers? Or where can I get pampers? Or how am I going to be able to get something to eat and cook and eat for my children at this time? And um, I don't think that people in general are prepared for these kinds of things, whether they be men or women. So I have nothing specific to add to this except to say that when it happens, it happens. And uh, lots of people see how interdependent they are when there is relief that comes in, like the Red Cross or other disaster responders. Uh, I just want to add something regarding Haiti. Uh, in Haiti, um, in a very sad and odd way, the uh, earthquake sort of I wouldn't say level the playing field, but uh, everyone, whether they were poor, uh, whichever class uh, they came from, uh, social class they came from, was a very heavily hit. Um, so uh, the impact, the economic impact, was felt uh, throughout society. And I have one last question. With climate change and natural disasters becoming more frequent, or, okay, sorry, with climate change and natural disasters becoming a transnationalist issue, in what ways can global community effectively mitigate this alarming crisis? And can I address this to the minister? Because I know you guys had like the Kyoto Protocol and wonderful things to really help mitigate. If I see just one bright spot in the middle of the crisis, that is, uh, it reminded the importance of electricity to the people. And as I said, 20% of the total capacity of this electric company was lost. Then people are reminded how inconvenient if you lose electricity. So, and uh, there is a planned sort of outages uh, frequently, even in Tokyo, and people are uh, suffering from that, but they never complain about it uh, because, uh, because of these tragedies. And uh, we have uh, more unfortunate persons are suffering in, in these areas. Uh, so, um, not directly related to global warming now, but but um, uh, it was uh, it was a good uh, sort of aspect that uh, people are reminded of the importance of saving energy, um, and, uh, and also perhaps this must be a kind of touch issues in international relations. But uh, whether we should promote more uh, nuclear power plants or not uh, is would be subject to further discussion 
in many, many countries in the world. And it is quite natural. And perhaps uh, we want international community to utilize the lessons we have learned uh, uh, of this crisis uh, for the betterment of the, uh, of the uh, um, energy savings and global warming and whatsoever for the betterment of the Earth environment. Okay. Okay, um, I would like to ask everyone to stand for a moment of silence um, for Japan and its solidarity, but also for other countries that have been affected by natural disasters, including Haiti, Chile, Hurricane Katrina. The uh, budget deficit too, and uh, the, uh, our budget uh, for uh, foreign aid has been decreasing. But still, uh, we are um, top donors still. And perhaps, uh, this, this is my personal opinion, but uh, perhaps uh, receiving such a huge aid from all over the countries uh, nowadays, perhaps uh, Japanese people are reminded once again that the foreign aid generosity we have shown to the world in the 30, 40 years uh, we did not expect any return from the international community, but the world has been watching us. The world has been watching what uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese people have been doing in terms of foreign aid. And I'm not going to say that this is a return or something like that, but perhaps uh, uh, foreign aid has been so helpful to creating uh, a friend in need. Uh, I'd just like to add something about this. When I was ambassador to Madagascar, the Japanese um, embassy officials would come uh, without any kind of nefarious reasons, but they came to the USAID and said, we have money that we want to and will get foreign aid to Madagascar and we would like to work with the USAID on projects. Uh, not where they had any that this is donation from Japan or anything. They are serious donors and we were very pleased to, to work with the Japanese on many of the uh, development issues that came up I would like to second that by saying that when I uh, went to uh, Haiti after the earthquake, uh, I visited Petit Guave. And the one visible, very, very visible thing, of, uh, the very visible mark of reconstruction in Petit Guave is the school. And uh, there is no uh, sign on that school saying who donated it. So I inquired and I found out that it was Japan. And it's a very nice school that is being built by the Japanese for the Haitian people after the uh, earthquake. And there is no fanfare about it. The Japanese are not even talking about their donation. So uh, the type of donation that Jap Japan is giving to to Haiti right after the earthquake was a very kind, very sincere, but without any fanfare type of aid. Nobody knew. There was no camera, nothing about it. But it was done, and it was, and it's very useful in Petigua of Haiti. So we thank you for that. Hello. My name is Rotenda Norman, and I'm a student here at Howard University. My question comes to um, all, who wants to answer? When, when a country has just finished going through such a natural um, disaster, we still have to deal with the dilemma of the poor. There are many people who rely on their riches and of course like you said it equals so levels the playing field a lot more but not always to a fast um, degree 
what happens or what commitments do a country take to ensure that everyone is being taken care of and not just those who come from prominent homes. This will be the last question and this is a, the, the, um, the one million dollar question. Uh, it involves politics a lot. It involves, uh, well, the international community. What are the steps that a country is taking? For example, in the case of Haiti, you had just, you just had an election, there's a new president, and uh, the whole international community will watch as to how the money is uh, distributed, who will benefit from the money, whether it's just the 35 prominent families, I mean, I think there are 35 or 36, something like that, or is the, is the reconstruction going to go to the people? So that's the million dollar question. And we will, uh, I think that our uh, attitude should be to simply sit back and wait and watch and to not be uh, hesitant as to uh, uh, call the uh, government of Haiti if it goes only to one section of the, of the population. 